I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer your questions about the First World War. And today, I have a, a, a guest for a brief period of time. We have a new intern here at the studio in Berlin, and I'm sort of forcing him to come in and say hi. Say hi. Hi, guys. Uh, tell them who you are and where you're from. I'm Joram Appel, which is uh, Dutch for Apple, uh, and I'm from Utrecht in the Netherlands. Okay, and uh, he has a degree in spelling from the University of Utrecht, actually, which is quite prestigious. One of the best spelling universities in the world. He enjoys tennis and cuddling and long walks on the beach at midnight. I really do. All right, okay, now get back to work. Okay. All right. Hop, hop. When I say jump, you say how high. Uh, how high. How high. How high. That's Dutch. <laughs> Robert Jeff the Hobo Cartwright. Really? I wonder how Robert Cartwright became known as Jeff the Hobo. There's a story that Robert Jeff the Hobo Cartwright is going to write into us and tell him the story of why he's known as Jeff the Hobo. But anyhow, his question is, uh, amphibious landings, World War I question. Hi, Indian crew. I'm sure most people are familiar with how landings were carried out in the Second World War, but what about the Great War? Were specifically, specially designed boats and ships used in landings at Gallipoli or for Operation Albion? Did amphibious warfare evolve during the war? Thanks for the tremendous work and keep it up. All right, Jeff the Hobo. It is true that there were some amphibious landings during the Great War. There were the amphibious operations at Albion and during the Zeebrugge raid, and there were multiple landings during the Gallipoli campaign, which we covered. For these operations, they used boats that were called lighters, which, like a cigarette lighter, right? Uh, there were several classes of these lighters. Of the larger, there was the larger motorized X lighter, which was designed for the Gallipoli campaign by Walter Pollock. Uh, that 200 units of that were constructed in 1915. The X lighters uh, were medium sized but flat bottomed ships that transported troops, horses, field guns, and they were used in the withdrawal of troops from Gallipoli. Now, these vessels, which were nicknamed Black Beetles, right? Um, they were pretty badly needed by the British Admiralty. So as a result, they were designed in only four days. Now, those used for transporting men and horses were given a K number. Uh, those for transporting water were given an L number. The smaller Y lighters were designed to transport infantry specifically, up to 80 men and their equipment, of course, uh, to the shore. Now, they were built out of steel or wood, and they were usually towed, steered, steered by oars, or, or propelled by gasoline-powered outboard motors. Um, y lighters really only gave you a minimal amount of cover, but because of the flat bottom and the light weight, they could go all the way up to the shore, which was really handy. Y lighters were also developed for the first time by the British for the amphibious landings at Gallipoli in 1915, and continued to transport infantry through the Mesopotamian campaigns. Yuri 1 Czech or Yuri 1 CZ, okay. Compensation for widows question. Hi, Indian team. Thank you for the great show. You're welcome. I have a question for Out of the Trenches, which is connected a bit with my family history. When the war broke out, my great-grandmother's husband got drafted into the army. He was either maimed or killed, although I do not know what exactly happened. As a result of that, she was given a tobacconist shop to uh, support her family, which stayed with her even after the war in the newly formed Czechoslovakia. Okay, so the CZ, he was Czech, right, okay. Uh, what were the compensations given to the families of those killed or crippled in the war throughout the warring nations? Uh, according to historian Jay Winter, one third of the total 9.7 million soldiers killed or missing in the war, and missing usually meant dead, um, they left behind, on average, a widow and two children. Uh, most of the countries granted a pension to widows, but the amount and the criteria for it varied between countries. Uh, in Germany, for example, the Kriegerwitwen, the war widows, they got financial compensation. Their pensions were based on the military rank and not the previous income of their husbands. A widow of a rank and file soldier got 33 and a, a point three, 33 and a third marks per month, which was about a quarter of a skilled worker's usual income. Okay, so that's not always enough to live on. So additional provisions were first organized temporarily by semi-public organizations. <clears throat> when looking at compensation given by states to the widows of war, you gotta keep in mind that many widows remarried right after the war. 
Uh, in France, for example, half of these 680,000 war widows had remarried already by 1921. And when they did, they were no longer entitled to financial compensation by the state. So that hints at the economic and social disadvantage of being widowed or, and being a single mother. Um, the amount of money that a French widow could get depended on the rank that her husband had held and on the exact cause of his death. However, both of these distinctions were largely irrelevant for the widows of common soldiers who formed the bulk of the French army. These women were awarded a pension of 800 francs a year with an extra 300 francs for each child under the age of 18. Uh, Anonymous says, uh, Hello, Indy and Great War crew. There is one distant relative of mine, Private Theobald P. Cote, or Cote, of Manchester, New Hampshire. He joined the U.S. Army and was assigned to the 103rd Infantry, the Yankee Division. Okay. Uh, he was injured during the Battle of Chateau Thierry, and he died from those injuries August 4th, 1918, in Contreville, Vosch, France. He was buried in Contreville, France. But after the war, he was exhumed and brought back to the United States. My question, therefore, is was this process of bringing American war dead back to the United States commonplace? Okay. During and after the war, um, American politicians and, and the relatives of soldiers, uh, soldiers debated what to do about just this, what to do with the dead. Many family members insisted that the bodies of the fallen had to be repatriated to the USA. Uh, others found the battleground to be sacred and wanted the soldiers to stay buried in the ground they fought over and paid for with their lives. Former President Teddy Roosevelt, who himself lost his son in the war, argued for the latter. We feel that where the tree falls there, let it lie, he wrote in a New York Times published letter to the War Department. Uh, nevertheless, um, Secretary of War Newton Baker made a promise in September 1918 to repatriate all American fallen soldiers. Now, this proved to be a logistical, financial, and hygienic nightmare. And after the emergence of a strong anti-repatriation movement, the pledge Baker made was no longer set in stone. So in the spring of 1919, Woodrow Wilson came to the rescue. He wanted to please everyone and came up with a new bill where parents could choose between having their dead buried at an American military cemetery overseas or return stateside at government expense. Using this option, more than 45,000 American families opted for repatriation of their loved ones to American soil. And I'll do have to point out that sadly enough, uh, and this is according to historian Steve Trout, some of the caskets contain the wrong bodies. Others, no bodies at all, just body parts thought to belong to the same individual. Um, that's it for today, but interestingly enough, we did an entire special episode when we were in France shooting last year about what to do with the American dead. We shot that at the American War Cemetery. Uh, you can click right here to see that episode, and you can also click subscribe to never miss an episode. See you next time.